Shall we open our Bibles at this time to the book of Acts, chapter 20? The Apostle Paul has been on missionary journeys, and one thing that he has felt led to do, called to do, in fact, pressed in the Spirit to do, is to go to Jerusalem and to minister to the saints there, and also to witness of the gospel to the Jews that are, are of course, his nation. And so uh, what we find is he is being warned by prophets that the path ahead of him is a troubled path. It's going to be a rough road. He has uh, bonds and afflictions. And so we come to our text in Acts chapter 20, verse 22 and through 24. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to understand and apply this great concept to our hearts and lives today of how to think and how to react when the road ahead looks rough. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Paul was warned by his friends because the Holy Spirit had revealed it to them that when Paul went to Jerusalem, he was going to be bound and he was going to be afflicted. Now it's interesting that God gave Paul these warnings about something that God had already told Paul that he was going to do and that it wouldn't be easy. He told him what great things he would suffer for his name's sake. He told him that he would be a witness before kings. So this was God's calling. This was part of the plan. Paul knew this is what he was supposed to do and what God was calling him to do. But God gave him the warnings because he wanted to prepare him for it and he would choose to go forward in that path. You see, here's the thing. When God calls you, he does not force you. Uh, when God calls you, he does not make it impossible for you to do otherwise. We do have a choice in what direction we will take in life. Even Paul, who knew that was his ministry, was warned and he could have said, as he was looking at the boat that was going to lead him to Jerusalem, he could have said, is there another boat around here? Is there another direction I could sail? He, he could have done that. But he said, I don't even count my life dear to myself that I might finish my course. I'm going to do what I have been led to do. So he looked ahead to a rough road, and he looked ahead to it with courage and with faith and with determination. Uh, the imagery given here is that what is true for Paul is true in the same way for you and I. We have a path that our life is to take. We have a calling from God. We have a purpose for our lives. Uh, it is important that we understand what it means to finish our course. Uh, now, we're going to look in the Bible at several uh, aspects of this truth and accompanying scriptures. And it is my prayer and it is my hope that by the time we get to the end, that we realize that each of us has a purpose. Each of us has been called by God to serve in some way. So first of all, let me make this point. God designed the course. God designed it. You see, God is God. God is the one who designs. God is the one who makes the path. He, 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 he is the one has, that has set your life's purpose. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great preacher, said this, There is not a spider hanging on the king's wall, but hath its errand. There is not a nettle that groweth in the corner of the churchyard, but hath its purpose. There is not a single insect fluttering in the breeze, but accomplisheth some divine decree. And I will never have it that God created any man, especially any Christian man, to be a blank, to be a nothing. He made you for an end. Find out what that end is. Find out your niche and fill it. If it be ever so little, if it is only to be a hewer of wood and a drawer of water, do something in this great battle for God's truth. That was what Spurgeon had to say about each solitary individual Christian life. 
Os Guinness, the author, wrote this, The secret of man's being is not only to live, but to live for something definite, to find the idea for which one can live and die. The Apostle Paul had a calling from God, and the path was before him, and the path looked rough. Uh, And he had warning signs along the way telling him exactly that was what lies ahead. But you see, he was running for a prize. He had a goal in mind, and that goal was to finish the course that God had put him on, even if it meant hardship. And so the Apostle Paul understood that God designed the course. Secondly, and we've got to understand this too, the course has obstacles. No one gets a totally smooth course. The whole purpose of the course is that there's going to be difficulties and challenges and obstacles along the way. No one ever accomplished anything worthwhile if it was easy. You know, there's some things that we need help with. There's certain things that we we really pray to God in a special way about. Uh, and, And I've found that the harder those things are, the more likely we are to pray and the more fervently we are to pray. Uh, When I was in school, and, you know, they talk about, you know, they outlawed prayer in school. Well, as long as they have tests, they're going to be prayer in school because these kids are going to be praying, Lord, help me not flunk this test. I was praying in school all the time. They didn't know it, but I was. Uh, And the idea was I wanted to pass a test. I didn't think to pray, Lord, help me to eat my lunch today. Just help me to get it down. No, I lived for lunch. Lunch was easy. I mean, whatever they put on the, on the table, uh, people were throwing lunch at me. My nickname in school was Grinder. Uh, if, if you didn't want it, give it to Leverett. He'll eat it. I didn't, I didn't have to pray for grace to eat my lunch. That was easy. Listen, there's things in life that are easy. Uh, you can do it. It's not hard. We don't give out awards. Nobody at the end of the school year gave me a blue ribbon for eating. Uh, they, they didn't recognize it, most likely to enjoy lunch. Uh, It was something that wasn't recognized. Why? Because that's easy. Uh, The the things in life that are worth it are hard. And so God, listen, God designs the course with some obstacles in it. Uh, The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 3 says this, No man, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know, here it is, we are appointed thereto. The Apostle Paul is saying, that's the plan. You're appointed to endure afflictions. For verily, when when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. And so the course has obstacles. Now, one of the things that we notice uh, in, let's take the Olympic Games and races, Uh, there is the idea in a race uh, to see which one is the fastest. And so people will train. And the Apostle Paul made a number of analogies of the Christian life uh, to the the, the athletics and the Olympic Games. And in a race, it's, it's funny how some of these races will on purpose put obstacles in the race. Now, the, the simplest race is that you start here and you run there and you see who gets there the first, uh, the quickest. That's, that's the race. But, you know, it's interesting. Let, let's make a race and we'll put some stuff in the way that they have to jump over. And so they put hurdles up. And you've seen the hurdles. And uh, these people have to learn to train not just to run, but to run in such a way as to allow them to pace themselves to jump over the hurdle and then run in such a way as to pace themselves so they, they can jump the next hurdle. And the idea is to see who can be the fastest, not just at running, but at running and jumping. They also have this strange one called the steeplechase. You hardly ever see this one because it's just kind of weird. Uh, but, you know, we think of the steeplechase for horses where there's a steeplechase for people, too. And what they do on that one is they have not only hurdles you have to jump over, but they have places where there's water, like you're jumping over a creek or something, and you have to do a broad jump over that. And sometimes people just land in it and splash along and go, let's make a race that has obstacles in it. And then we have the granddaddy of all, the obstacle race, where not only do you run, but you have to climb things and crawl under something and wade through something, and you come out the end, and it's not just the person who can run fast, it's the person who can do all those other obstacles as well. Uh, They have this strange thing called the biathlon. 
which is basically skiing and shooting. Not just skiing. We're going to ski a while, and then we're going to stop and shoot a while. Which tells me there's rednecks in the Alps, too. Because that's, that's the kind of sport some redneck would come up with. We're, we're going to ski, and then we're going to shoot, too. Uh, there's rednecks all over the world. You, they just may not call themselves that, but they are. Uh, and so they came up with this sport of skiing and shooting, and they give it a fancy name like biathlon, and there's people that train all the time to ski and to shoot. Now, all of these require a certain set of skills. And then they have that strange race that's called race walking. Race walking. And you've seen them. They just do this kind of thing, and they, they swivel, and they, uh, they, they, their feet can't leave the ground is the rule, and, they, and they're walking fast. You know, who can, who can walk the fastest? And, uh, you know, Bob Costas, the sports annou- announcer, he describes race walking as kind of a contest to see who can whisper the loudest, you know. It's kind of the way he described that, you know, and it's hard to watch that because it's, it's, it's kind of, well, it's kind of weird. It's boring. Uh, and then they have the marathon. It's not about who's necessarily uh, the fastest sprinter, but who has the most endurance to keep up the speed for that long. And there are sprinters who are great at sprinting, but they're not marathon racers. And there are marathon racers who are great at that, but they're not that great at sprinting. And of course, I'd like to see how any of them do in the race walking thing. That would be interesting to find out. So the course has obstacles. God has made your life not trouble free. God has made your life with trouble in it. Now, we wouldn't ask for it, would we? When we're young, we don't pray to God and say, Lord, I, I would really like some hardship in my life. It looks too easy out there. It looks like it's going to be a downhill run. Would you, Lord, for me, make it hard for me? Would you make it something I have to really work against? Would you give me some setbacks? Would you give me some pitfalls? Would you give me some opposition? No, none of us are going to ask for that. That's something against our nature. We want an easy path. But God knows better, and He gives us the obstacles to build us and to strengthen us and to give us something to overcome. We're never going to know the thrill of victory if we've never been in a battle. We're never going to have a sense of accomplishment if we've never had a challenge to do something that took effort and work and determination. God wants us to have the full spectrum of human emotion. Therefore, He has made a course with obstacles. But now here's number three. You were created to run it. You were created for that course because that course was created for you. Both of those things are true. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, speaking about God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to, here it is, His own purpose. And grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. In other words, God's eternal plan involved you on your life course with the obstacles for the glory of God. That is, you were created to run it. Every man or woman that God has called by His name and has had to go through challenges uh, will have God's grace. Many have been called to endure great opposition even persecution. Some have been called to become martyrs for the glory of God. But God has equipped you and will empower you for the path that God has called you to go down. In other words, you were made for this. This is something God made just for you and made you just for it. We are called, like Paul, to take the path God has laid before us and not to try to deviate away from it, but to accept it, embrace it, and go down it. Paul said, Neither do I count my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. So you were created to run it. And also, number four, God's grace is available. Listen, He doesn't expect you to do it alone. He doesn't expect you to Go through life's course for you without His blessing and without His help. Everyone that God calls, God empowers. Everyone that God calls, He enables. That is what God does. God does not expect us to go it alone. 
Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 7, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, how much grace is God going to give you? Enough. How much grace is available to you to go down the life track that God has placed you on? Enough. God has enough grace for you to do what He has called you to do. If we find ourselves short on grace, it's because we have failed to avail ourselves of the grace that God provides. And sometimes isn't that how we find ourselves? Sometimes we are like Peter, who started out pretty good when he left the boat, and he has had his eyes fixed on Jesus, and he's walking on the water. And I imagine that felt pretty good. Walking on the water, walking on the water, walking on the water to Jesus. I'm walking on the water. But all of a sudden, he got to looking around and said, wait a minute, I'm walking on the water. And it came to him, and he saw the wind, and he saw the, uh, the, the storm, and he started to sink. And he prayed a real short prayer. It's a good thing that Peter didn't have a long-winded prayer life. He just said, Lord, save me. And uh, the Lord picked him up and brought him back into the boat. If he'd have started like some uh, you know, people do, uh, he'd have, been, he'd have uh, been so flowery, he'd have drowned before he got to the part where he said, Lord, save me. But he had a, a quick prayer. And, and so the, the idea is God's grace is available. Now, here's the part about the track. We can all be winners. You see, while it's true that the Apostle Paul used the Olympic Games as an analogy for the race that we're to run, there's a big difference. And the big difference is that we are not in competition with another believer. I am not going to win because somebody else loses. We can all win the race that God has called us to run. Now let's look at the analogy that is used, and then let's understand uh, how it is different in the Christian life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, we have this wonderful analogy that the Apostle Paul gives. It's an exhortation. It's an encouragement. And here's what he says. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So they're all running to achieve a prize. All right? So run that ye may obtain. Now that part of the analogy is that we ought to run just like Olympic runners do to obtain the prize, to put the same training, the same discipline, the same effort into it. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. In other words, these athletes had to watch their diet. These athletes had to train themselves. It might feel better to sleep that extra hour. No, they had to get up. It might feel better to lay off this day and not train. No, they had to train that day too. They had to be disciplined. All right? Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Something that's here today and gone tomorrow. But we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. In other words, he said, I'm, I'm done training I'm running the race. I'm not just running in circles. I'm not just running around trying to develop myself. I'm running toward a goal. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. He's talking about shadow boxing, how they'll get up there and they'll practice their boxing. He says, I've got a real enemy. I'm boxing. And that's the world, the flesh, and the devil. All right? But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now what the Apostle Paul is saying here, he said, I don't want to be in the race and lose, but I can only defeat myself. I'm not racing against you. I am racing against my own track. Now, since we are made different, and since we have an individual track given to us by God, it's foolish for me to think, I'm going to beat out Bob Curtis. I'm going to beat out Brother Howard. Or I'm going to beat out Brother Ken. What a foolish notion. We're not racing against each other. Listen, I've got a track that I'm, a, I'm looking at. And listen, my gifts and the things that God has placed in my possession as a steward of is unique to me and the same is true for all of us. And my track is unique to me, and the same is true for all of us. Now that would be like somebody saying, okay, there's two tracks here, and one of them is a 100-yard dash, and one of them is a 100-yard steeplechase 
with obstacles in it and hurdles and and little uh, bodies of water to jump over. And we want you to race on this one and you to race on this one. What would you say? Well, that doesn't look fair, does it? Doesn't really look fair. Well, you see, that's the whole thing. Everybody's course is different. How far are you ahead? Uh, What does that mean? It doesn't even mean anything. You don't know how far anybody is ahead. Uh, We're not comparing. We're not competing. Listen, we don't know where we are. Uh, Jesus put it this way. He, He said, many first shall be last. Many last shall be first. You don't know where you are, and you don't know where anybody else is. We've all got our own track to run down. And since we're made different, and since we're on a different track, the concept of winning is different than in the Olympic Games. Paul exhorts us to run to obtain. But the idea is to have as much determination and as much zeal in our individual race as competitors have when only one can win. They must be disciplined, so must we. They must work, so must we. They must be determined, so must we. We have the ability to win with God's help. Everyone who God has redeemed and called in to be His child is on a specially designed track. Your track is yours and nobody else's. And nobody else can run your track but you. And God has equipped you to run your track. You ever think about the Apostle Paul? God didn't call everybody to do what Paul did. God called, called Paul to be a special servant. He said, you're going to talk, you're going to speak before kings. Not everybody spoke before kings. You're going to suffer great things for my name. Others just kind of basically live normal lives. They may have gone through some degree of persecution like unemployment or, or disenfranchisement from society, but, but they weren't called to be martyrs. They were able to live their lives and die a natural death uh, in their beds at home. Everybody's called to a different track. The Apostle Paul had his own track to go down, and it was different than everyone else's. Uh, Listen, the track that Paul was on had some prison involved. You ever think about what we read in the Bible? We read, we're reading like the highlights. Uh, There's not a great deal of scripture given to Paul's average day as a prisoner in a Roman dungeon. Well, we don't read, I woke up today and the guard who I was chained to all night snored and kept me up, and I couldn't sleep, and I'm cold, and I'm lonely, and I'm sick, and I really would like something to do besides be chained to this Roman guard who has body odor and snores and doesn't like me. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the kind of letter I might write, you know. That's the kind of letter you might write. The Apostle Paul was encouraging other people while he was in those dungeons. He was writing the epistles. He was being used to write Scripture. He was a unique individual. He used his situation to be a blessing. But think about the boredom of being a prisoner. Now, Paul was a guy who was used to being on the fast track. He was traveling. He was working. He was preaching. He was teaching. uh, He was uh, building tents and, and having an evening and a Sabbath ministry. Paul was on the fast track for many years. But there came a time when God says, okay, part of your track, Paul, is you're going to be a prisoner of Rome. I'm going to let Rome finance your ministry from this point on. They're going to pay your bills. They're going to feed you. They're going to provide shelter for you. And uh, they're going to give you your next audience, which will be kings and rulers. And I'm going to anoint you and empower you to be a witness to them. And it's going to be at Rome's expense. Doesn't God have a sense of humor? And so the Apostle Paul was placed in that situation. And there was some boredom involved. But you see, Paul was older now. And maybe, maybe God knew that being older, he doesn't need to be on the fast track like he did. We don't know why God does what he does. Why does God sideline sometimes? You ever think back in the Old Testament, back in the Old Testament, you had Elijah and you had Ahab and you had Jezebel. And there was all that paganism and all that idol worship going on. And there were prophets that were being hid in a cave, 50 here and 50 there. And uh, a man was going to feed them. Now, can you imagine the cave ministry? I mean, you're basically talking about preaching to the choir. 
uh, these prophets were preaching to each other in the cave ministry. I I wonder how many results they had. I wonder how many converts they had in the cave ministry as they were waiting for their next meal for someone to bring them so that they wouldn't get killed by Jezebel and so they wouldn't die of starvation. That's a tough track to be on. Talk about boring. You know, with all the things that have been going on lately, we talk about the COVID epidemic and all of this thing that's going on, and it's tough. It's really tough. Uh, There's a psychological toll it takes. People's lives are being disrupted. People are losing their businesses. Some people are going through real difficulties, not even to talk about those that have been sick and those that have died from it. But you think about, for a lot of people, this COVID thing that's happened to our country means that they're kind of cooped up inside and binge-watching TV shows indefinitely. Now, that's a tough way to live, but you know, it's not as bad as the Holocaust. It's not as bad as the Spanish flu was many years ago. It's not as bad as what has happened with the bubonic plague in Europe. You know, we are experiencing now, in my opinion, something that I have called tribulation light. It's like a foretaste of what could come. How are we going to react and how are we going to hold on to the faith if real difficult times come? If there's real persecution, if preachers and Christian ministers and faithful witnesses are imprisoned and even put to death, as has happened many times through history, where are we going to be? Listen, every Christian that serves God can be a winner. We have our own track. It may be one of martyrdom, it may be one of persecution, or it may be one of just being faithful in difficult times. It may be one of being able to take boredom at times, but be faithful in it. We have the ability to serve God. No one but Paul was going down his path. And listen, no one else is going down your path but you. I can be a blessing to you. I can help you. I can pray for you. I can maybe even assist you, and you can assist me and pray for me. But listen, when it comes down to it, we each have to go down our own path. We have to be faithful where God has placed us. Everyone has a different path. One time, Jesus was walking on the Sea of Galilee along the shore with Peter. And uh, he asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter three times said, well, you know I do. And you know that whole scene that they had. And uh, Jesus told Peter something. He said, you know, Peter, when you were young, you'd put on your clothes and you'd go wherever you want to go. But when you're old, someone else is going to bind you and take you where you don't want to go. Now that was Jesus' way of telling Peter, when you're old, You're going to die a martyr's death. You see, the thing that Peter was afraid of, that was his track. It wasn't going to happen until he was old, but that was his track. That's where his track was going to take him if he stayed on it. If he stayed faithful, if he stayed, uh, you know, a, a preacher, if he kept doing what God called him to do, it was going to end up him being bound and taken to his death. So that's what Peter got from Jesus. So what did Peter do? He looked over at John. What about John? Jesus rebuked Peter. He said, what does John have to do with you and me? If it were my will that he could live till I come again, what is that to you? You serve me. Now what was Jesus telling Peter? Don't worry about other people. Don't think about what their track is. Don't think about what their future is. You think about your own track. Because you and I have a special relationship. And that's what is true for all of us. Listen, don't ever envy. Envy is such a waste of emotion. Such a waste of time. Such a waste of human energy to envy. The person you envy may be going through more difficulties that you could possibly even imagine. The person that you envy now, you may pity next year. And they may envy you. It is such a waste of time to envy. We ought to all be sympathetic as we can to others because we all have an individual track and none of us are getting a free ride. None of us are getting an easy path. There's always going to be something in the way. Jesus said in Revelation 22 verse 12, And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Not according as as he has beat out the other Christians. We can win. You can win. There's two reasons that you can win. First of all, 
if you stay on track. The Apostle Paul had a path ahead of him. As he looked out over the Aegean, as he looked out that way toward Jerusalem, he knew that bonds and afflictions awaited him. He could have gotten on a different boat to a different location and perhaps avoided what was waiting on him in Jerusalem. But he would not have won the prize that God had before him to finish his course. We must stay on track. And secondly, we've got to finish. Now, what does it mean to finish? We don't always know. One thing's for sure. If you're here today and you're drawing breath, you're not finished yet. If you can still fog a mirror, you're not done. You can still pray. You can still fight death. I mean, don't go peacefully in your sleep. Struggle against it. Kick the footboard. Ask for a few more minutes. God may give you something in that time that you could use as a great blessing. We don't know when we're finished. You're finished when God says you're finished. He can send a lightning bolt. He can send a heart attack or a stroke or some crazy man with a gun. It doesn't matter. Whatever God may use to help you finish your race, that's when you go and you find out how you did. And we won't know until we get there. Jesus is the one that has our reward, not you and I. I'm glad of that, aren't you? I'm glad Jesus is the one who made my track. Uh, I'm glad Jesus is the one who called me to run down my track. I'm glad that my track is my track and not your track. I would certainly fail on another person's track. But I have a, an opportunity to be a blessing before God and others on the track that He has put me on. Hebrews chapter 12, the great imagery here. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. In other words, there are people watching us. There are people who have run their race, and now they're watching us. So great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That's what we learn from Scripture. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, Jesus finished his race. He finished his course. He did what he was supposed to do, and he is now rewarded by being on the right hand of power. Jesus Christ is our example. He had a path that included the cross. And he kept on that path until on the cross he said, it is finished. And it was finished when it was finished. We think of Paul as he aged, as his hair turned gray, as his hair fell out, as his back was stooped, as his voice became weak, and as he became at that point in life where it may have been more worthy for him to think I'd just soon go. I'd just soon be with God. Here's what he wrote. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. He's writing to his protege, a young minister named Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Let me read that again. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day. And here's what he says. And not to me only. Not to me only. I'm not the only one that can win. I'm not the only one that can be rewarded by God for faithful service in the course that God has laid before me. Not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. The Apostle Paul is saying this. Are you looking forward to Jesus coming again? Are you looking forward to His kingdom? Are you looking forward to reward day? 
If that's your goal in life, and if you're on your track, and if you're keeping the faith, and if you're fighting the good fight, and you're finishing the, the course, then you can expect to, to achieve and, re, and find the same reward that Paul had. Because listen, God only expects you to do your best with what you have been given and with what you have been faced with. I had a lady come to me one time. She said, I don't feel like I'm doing much work for God. I don't feel like I'm doing much. And I said, well, what, 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 what do you think you ought to do? And she said, well, my husband, he's, he's not a Christian. He, he, he's a good man. He treats me right, but he's not a Christian. And so we don't give. I'd like to give, but he, he manages the money, so I don't give. What, what I give is just mine. It's not much. And, and she said, I'm trying to teach my kids to, to love Jesus and to serve the Lord but I don't get much help, you know, from my husband. And, and she went on to describe the different things that she was hindered at and that she wasn't able to do and, and was feeling bad about it. And so here, here's what I said. I said, look, I said, all Jesus is expecting you to do is what you can do and what is within your power to do and what are choices that you are making. And let me tell you this. What choices other people make does not subtract, subtract from who you are. If you have done right, if you have done your best, if you have been faithful, if you have prayed, if you have trusted, then God will reward you for that and the decisions other people make, that is up to them. Think for a minute. Who's a winner? Who's a loser? Who's ahead? Who's behind? I think of two evangelists. One was named Jonah. Jonah didn't want to follow God. God made him do it anyway. He didn't like the people he preached to. In fact, he hated them. He wanted them to all be killed. He preached the worst sermon in the history of sermons. With the worst attitude in the history of attitudes. And had the greatest revival the world has ever seen. A whole city repented before God. The king, the court, the common people. He even had cows repented. How many people can say, I got so many cows that repented? They were wearing sackcloth and mooing before God. A whole city. Bad attitude. Sitting on a hill looking over and saying, Get them, God, get them. Wanted them to be judged. Then I think of another evangelist, Stephen, the great Grecian Christian who so convinced the Jews that they could not withstand his wisdom. In other words, he won every debate. He convinced them mightily through the Word, through Scripture, and the anointing, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with compassion, filled with love and a heart of forgiveness. And he preached his heart out to them. And the reaction was they all ran on him and they stoned him to death and he died. They didn't have an altar call. They didn't, nobody wore sackcloth. He, he didn't have a single cow that repented. A single person that repented. So who was the winner? Who was the one who won the prize? Well, I'll tell you what we do know. There was a young lawyer named Saul of Tarsus who was there. And apparently he had a vote in stoning Stephen. But he remembered what Stephen had said and he remembered the anointing he had and he remembered when Stephen, who had a face like an angel, and at the end he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Lay not this sin to their charge. And Paul remembered that. And later when Jesus appeared to him, Jesus said, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against those goads, isn't it? In other words, Jesus said, aren't you tired of fighting Saul? And he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And at that time, Saul became Paul. Because Stephen preached a sermon that killed him. We don't know who's winning, do we? We don't know who's ahead, do we? It doesn't matter what we think. 
It matters, are you on the path that God has called you to be on? And if you're still breathing, if your heart is still beating, you still have a purpose, you have a reason for being here, and it may be that God takes any one of us tonight or tomorrow, but as long as we're living, we have the ability to do something for the kingdom of heaven. We have a wonderful opportunity to go down our track And when Paul was at the end, he wrote that letter. And it wasn't long before they pulled him out of that pit. And they laid his head over a stone. And a Roman soldier took a sword and separated his head from his body at the order of Nero, the wicked king. He was despised. He was rejected. He was killed. But as soon as Paul made it to heaven, his Savior Jesus was waiting on him to embrace him and welcome him home. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to run our race with patience and with faith and with persistence and courage. Lord, sometimes the road ahead looks rough and it may be a little frightening, a little daunting. And sometimes it looks ambiguous. We just don't know. We don't know what's ahead. It, It's all shrouded in fog and question marks, and we don't know what's ahead. And sometimes that can be frightening, the fear of the unknown, what lies ahead. But Lord, we know that whatever it is that lies ahead, you're there with us. And you already have a plan for our victory. Lord, I pray that you would help us to stay true to the course that you placed us on. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together.